In science, only metric units are used. Metric system is used by all scientists, no matter what language they speak. Because of this, they are able to share their results with other scientists anywhere in the world and be understood. Metric system is an internationally recognized decimal system of measurement. It provides a consistent and logical approach to measuring physical quantities. The system was first developed in France during the French Revolution in the late 18th century and has since been adopted by most countries as their official system of measurement. Only three countries in the world that don't use metric system widely are the United States, Liberia, and Myanmar. All people in other countries use metric system in their everyday life. This is why it is referred as SI, which means System International Unité or International System of Units. The system of measurements that we use in the USA is Old English system, imperial system, which uses unit called feet, quarts, and pounds. Such measurements do not offer the most precise and convenient calculations even in everyday practices. The food comes from the food size of King Henry I of England or his large shoes. The other units are of similar nature. Familiar objects and parts of the body were used as measuring devices. As one might guess, those measurements do not offer the most precise and convenient calculations. Metric system is much easier to use because it is decimal system of measurement, meaning it is based on multiples of 10. One does not need a calculator to convert metric system units. Here is an example. Please pause this video and tell me which of the following is the easiest to calculate. I think the answer is quite obvious. You do not need a calculator to tell me how many pennies in two and a half dollar. It is 250. Or you do not need a calculator to tell me how many dimes in 15 dollars. It is 150 dimes. Why are those questions are the easiest to answer? Because it is based on multiples of 10. So we sort of use metric system in the USA for a long time. Either we want to recognize this or not. One might want to ask, what are those multiples of 10? Well, 10 millimeters equal one centimeter. 10 centimeters equal one decimeter. 10 decimeters equal one meter. And 1,000 meters equal one kilometer. So it is all based on multiples of 10. By the way, I will not mention decimeters in this exercise. I will this, leave this for perhaps another video. Even though officially the United States does not take full advantage of metric system, we sort of using metric system in the USA for a long time. We had metric money system from the start. And we had metric photography, 35 millimeter film, 50 millimeter lens. It is all metric. Medical dosing was always metric. One cc means one cubic centimeter. Nutrition labels from the beginning use metric system. How many grams of sugar or fat? We also have metric bottles of soft drinks. We do not buy quarts of Coca-Cola or Pepsi. We buy liters of Coca-Cola, Pepsi, Sprite, and other soft drinks. Moreover, drug dealers in the Uni United States always used metric system. And of course, all scientists, even in the USA, use metric system. In this part of the exercise, we will use metric units for measuring distance. Synonyms for distance are height, length, width, depth, diameter, radius. To measure distance of length, kilometers, meters, centimeters, millimeters, micrometers are used. Micrometer also called micron. Micron is an unofficial, although widely used unit name. Micrometer is formally more correct as unit of length than a micron. Again, here are five types of measurements you need to know. Kilometer, meter, centimeter, millimeter, micrometer. Note that in abbreviation of micrometers, there is a Greek letter mu, mu m. Mu stands for micro. 
To make it visual, I will use examples of objects that you might be familiar with. Thus, one kilometer is about length of George Washington Bridge in New York City. One kilometer equals 1,000 meters. So tell me, how many meters in five kilometers? You are correct, it is 5,000 meters. Do you need a calculator to convert kilometers into meters? Obviously not. Now convert one meter into kilometer. You are correct if you said 0 0.001 kilometer. No calculator needed. Just move the decimal point to the left since kilometers are 1,000 times larger than meters. It's no brainer. Two meters is 0 0.002 kilometers. Nice and easy, and so on. One meter is about an average cane height. One meter equals 100 centimeters. Question, how many centimeters in three meters? You do not need to pause the video to say 300 centimeters, agree? So it is easy as pie, isn't it? And this is the reason we use metric system in science. One centimeter is about of size of a shirt button. In one centimeter, there are 10 millimeters. One millimeter is about of thickness of penny or width of a credit card. Each millimeter is a tenth of a centimeter. One millimeter is 1,000 micrometers, which is about a width of a typical bacteria. Now please convert one micrometer to millimeter. As I just said, one millimeter equals 1,000 micrometers. Therefore, it is 0 0.001 millimeters. Easy. We move decimal point to the left since millimeter is larger unit. Now let's convert one micrometer to one meter. To do this, you have to know that one meter equals 100 centimeters. One centimeter equals 10 millimeters and one millimeter equals 1,000 micrometers. This information tells us that one meter equals 1,000 millimeters, correct? To convert from micrometers to meters, you have to divide your figure by one million. Therefore, one micrometer equal to one millionth of a meter. In this course, we will not use micrometers often, but you need to know this since occasionally I will refer to these units. The most common units I will refer will be centimeters and millimeters. Now time for more questions. What is the realistic measurements of a human organ called kidney? Both 11 kilometers and 11 meters will be too big. Both 11 millimeters and 11 micrometers will be too small. The only realistic measurement of a kidney is 11 centimeters. What is the best estimate for the height of a human? The best estimate for the human height is 175 centimeters, which equal 1.75 meters. One kilometer will be way too long. 30 millimeters is too small, tiny. 200 micrometers cannot be our answer because it is too minuscule. Remember, we use micrometers when we measure bacteria or single cell. Seven meters is too long. After all, the tallest man, Robert Whitlock, was only 2.72 meters tall. Here is the ruler with centimeters on one side and the inches on another. Can you identify on which side are inches and on which side are centimeters? The question is too simple. The ruler has its units marked with its abbreviation. And you undoubtedly noticed that inches are longer than centimeters. One centimeter, two centimeter, three centimeters, four centimeters. Note, you should not count the lines. You should count the gaps between the lines. No matter what system you use, metric or not metric, five gaps, five centimeters. Each centimeter has 10 millimeters. This makes conversions very easy. One centimeter is 10 millimeters. 
So two centimeters is 20 millimeters and so on. Do we need calculator to convert centimeters to millimeters? I hope not. How many millimeters are in the marked length? Seven millimeters. Remember, we're counting gaps between lines, not lines itself. Remember that measurement starts at zero, not at the edge of the ruler. Do not include this portion of the ruler in your measurements. This is the most common mistake students make. Now let's practice measuring things with a metric ruler. We will start with a pencil. This pencil is 16.65 centimeters long. Do you agree with me? It seems that the point of the pencil is just in the middle between 16.6 and 16.7. Therefore, we record the measurement as 16.65. 16.6, 16.7, therefore we record the measurements as 16.65. Now let's measure diameter of a quarter. As you remember, the diameter a straight line passing from side to side through a center of circle. Quarter is a circle. Every diameter is a quart, but not every quart is a diameter. Keep this in mind. Note, this quarter not lined up with zero. Can we still determine the diameter? Yes, we can precisely measure the diameter of the quarter. All we have to do is to draw appropriate lines. And we know exactly what distance we have to measure. Since the lines are thick, we will pay attention only the inner side of the line, not the outer side of the line. And now we'll start counting. One centimeter, two centimeters. We can record the number. We have whole number two, two centimeters, but we are not done yet. We can put the point next to the number two and start counting the smaller units called millimeters. We have some of them on the left and on the right side. Let's start with the left side one millimeter or one tenth of a centimeter, two millimeters, that is to say two tenths of a centimeter or 0.2 centimeter, one millimeter or one tenth of a centimeter, two millimeter or two tenths of a centimeter, three millimeters, that is to say three tenths of the centimeter or simply 0.3 centimeter. Finally, we can record the final answer. The diameter of the quarter is 2.5 centimeters. We did it. We used the centimeter lines to determine the whole numbers and the millimeter lines to determine the tenth. If the diameter of a quarter is 2.5 centimeters, what is a radius? Reminder, radius is a line segment that connects the center of the circle to its boundary which means the radius is half of the diameter. I hope you do not need calculator to divide 2.5 centimeters by two. You are absolutely correct. The radius is 1.25 centimeters. Now we will have a little exercise measuring human height and upper limb length. You see, often when paleontologists or archaeologists find a skeleton, it is not complete. Sometimes it is possible to use lens of a single bone to estimate the height of an individual. Some people say that individuals with long upper limbs tend to be tall. As such, the length of a person's upper limb would be equal to 40% of his or her height. Let's test this hypothesis using measurements. For this, you will have to measure upper limb and height of yourself and then each of your classmates, roommates, friends, or relatives. The main idea of what we're going to do is to estimate either or not there is a correlation between the upper limb length and height in humans. Correlation describes the relationship between two data sets. In our case, 
it is a human height and upper limb length. Here is how to measure your upper limb length. First, you have to align the zero mark on your measuring tape to the tip of your middle finger. Then you hold the measuring tape and extend your arm out, palm facing down. Measure up the length of your arm until you reach the center of your armpit. Record this measurement. I will put 71 centimeters. You will have to record your measurement. Here is how to measure your height. First, stand against the wall. Your heels, shoulders, and head should be all touching the wall. Then mark the point where the top of your head is on the wall behind you. Measure from the point you mark down to the floor. This is your height. Record this data. I put my data, you put yours. Now put your data to the data table. Note that according to the table, you will be participant or subject number one. Note, you should not write the abbreviations of the units next to the data, since they are already indicated in the row above, the head row of the table. Sometimes students either put data in the wrong column or they get confused where to put what. This will happen to you if you do not read the head row of the table. So pay attention to the titles in the head row and you will not be lost. To find out what is predicted upper limb length should be, all you have to do is to multiply your height by 0.4. Remember our initial hypothesis, often called null hypothesis, was that an upper limb is about 40% of the human height. So let's record the number. This indicates what your upper length should be according to your initial hypothesis or null hypothesis. The fifth column will indicate the actual percentage of height. As you can see from the written equation, for this you have to divide your upper limb length by your height and multiply by 100. The slash that you see there is a division sign. So let's record the result. Before transferring this number, you will have to round it up to the whole number, which will make 41. Sometimes students ask, look at the number I got. It is not 40. It is 41 or 44. Did I do anything wrong? Hold your horses. This is only one data. What we do now is collecting data sets. At this point, you have to turn off your thinking devices, otherwise you might become biased. Just precisely follow your instructions or protocol, and only later you can examine your data sets and interpret your hypothesis. Here's a data set that I got from one of my classes. Now we will have to build a graph plotting our data using x and y axis. Graphs communicate information visually. They can show patterns which help scientists identify correlations and get the point of the experiment across quickly. In our graph, we will put the upper limb length of each subject on the x-axis. And we put the height of each subject on the y-axis. So we will work with a bivariate data, which means we take two variables in consideration and we try to see a pattern on how they relate. So now you have to look at your data table and find the shortest and the longest upper limb. From data I have the shortest upper limb is 60 centimeters long. And the longest upper limb is 75 centimeters long. Therefore, on the x-axis, I would break my graph between 55 and 80 centimeters. Here is the complete grid to plot upper limb length. Now you have to look at your data table and find the shortest and the tallest height. Not hard to find. The shortest is 155 centimeters and the tallest is 180 centimeters. So how about we will start our grid with 150 centimeters and end up our grid with 180 centimeters. Here it is. And now we will fill in everything in between. Now it's time to plot our data on the graph. Let's start with the first row in the data table. It is your upper limb, length, and height. First, I find 71 centimeters on x-axis. You find your number. 
Then I put my number of the height, which is 175 on y-axis. Do not draw red lines. I drew them to remind you how to plot the data points on the graph. All you want to do is to put a thick point in the right place. Now it's time to plot the data from the second data row. My numbers are 67 and 168. And so on. My last numbers are 70 and 167. Look at your graph. We are not to connect dots here. Our goal is to draw a line of best fit. However, even without the line of best fit, we can see that there is a positive correlation here because as X is increasing, Y is also increasing. A line of the best fit is a straight line drawn on a scatter plot that best represents the data of a scatter plot. A line of the best fit should be drawn as close as possible to all of the points on a scatter plot. A line of best fit not only will represent patterns of our data, but also will help us to use observed data to predict unobserved data. It can go through all of the points, some of the points, or none of the points. We will have to draw it as close to the points as possible. Ideally, it should be the same amount of points below the line and above the line, but this is not always possible. Obviously, line like this does not represent our data. No, like this. Or no, like this. From what we see, our plotted data is going upward from the left to the right, and we want to have the line to represent the movement of our data. For this reason, we want the amount of our points to be the same above our line and below our line. Of course, it will not be possible, as I mentioned earlier, but we will do our best. Something like this looks somewhat appropriate. Almost three points are on the line. Four are above and three are below. I will repeat again. In order to draw a line of best fit, we have to estimate a straight line that would go through or close to most of the plotted points. By looking at my line of best fit and the plotted data, I would call it a moderate positive correlation. Here is what we call a perfect positive correlation. I do not see this pattern on my graph. Still, my data suggested that our hypothesis might be correct. With the increase of height, there are increase in upper limb length. The main weakness of my study is that I do not have many participants. Therefore, I have only 10 data plots. A strong positive correlation would look something like what you see on this graph, where data points either on the line of the best fit or very close to it. My data points do not look like what you just saw. So my study supports our hypothesis only moderately, not strongly. I wonder what your graph looks like. If we had graph data points like this, where they, where plotted data is going downwards from left to right, this will be called a negative correlation. As X is increasing, the Y is decreasing. So according to this graph, the taller the person is, the shorter his or her upper limb lengths are. This is not true according to my data set. And obviously, if I had this type of data set, this will disprove our hypothesis. Or if I had my points scattered all over, this will indicate absence of any correlation, since there is no pattern that we can see. We can call it no relationship between X and Y. As I said earlier, we often use line of best fit to predict unobservable data. What does this mean? Here's an example. Having a line of best fit on front of us will allow us to predict what the height a person was if we found only a single upper limb of, we'll say, 63 centimeters long. According to my graph, 
the person must have been 163 centimeters tall. This means that upper limb is 39% of his or her height, which is close to 40% of our initial assumption. I wonder what is an estimation for this length of limb your line of best fit will show. On this, we finish with brief and very general introduction to measurements of length or measurements of distance. This video is for students in non-science major course and had no real mass to it. For science major students and real health professionals, I would bring statistical approach in testing hypotheses. What we had covered in this video is very, very basic.